Our state is getting bigger, and we aren't talking about its economy or its population, but its waistline. Every extra pound on the bathroom scales means extra tax pressures and less productivity. We'll talk with a couple of public health pros. Also this week, how much will the thaw in the trade war warm Arkansas farmers? And what could new violence in the Middle East mean for the diesel that agriculture demands? Arkansas Week, in a moment. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89. Say thank you. Uh, hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. At the top of the program, a return to the fields, so to speak. A lessening, if only that, in trade tensions between the U.S. and China. What impact on agriculture, our multi-billion dollar industry, and how big a threat does military conflict pose to the fuel? that farmers need. Joining us tonight, Matt King, Director of Governmental Affairs at the Arkansas Farm Bureau, and Dr. Mark Cochran returns. He's Vice President of Ag at the University of Arkansas. Gents, thanks very much for coming in this fall. Only that in the uh, tariff wars between Washington and Beijing. How big an impact? The tariffs have been huge for agriculture in this trade war that continues to linger on. We've seen soybean exports across the United States down more than 51% year over year. Sales are down to, to China there. That's resulted in about a four million, 4 million ton shortfall year over year for soybeans, which has caused prices to be depressed. We've got more soybeans in storage right now than we've had in decades. It's just a horrible situation depressing these prices and things for farmers. Well, the Chinese are at least buying again, the, not the, as much. The, Ch the Chinese have started buying, but we've yet to see some of this realized in the marketplace just because of how much we have in stocks and things like that. And we've heard the story before. If you remember back in May, whenever there was an opportunity to, to go in and see this, the market's much more cautious than kind of in a wait and see. We had one of our farmers we were talking the other day and he talked about where we are right now. You're asking, what do you think about the trade war? How do you feel about this? He said, um, my faith is strong, but my patience is short. So they, they're hopeful for that we will see some type of finale to this and get this, this market open back up but they're very cautious and this has had a long-term toll on them. Yeah, Dr. Cochran, doesn't really sound like that much of a thaw. Well, you know, I guess you can't be in agriculture if you don't have some degree of optimism off of it. So at least they're talking. I think both sides, there's kind of a split in terms of whether or not that there are some things that they could get in a partial agreement, including agriculture, or whether they need to hold out for a whole compre comprehensive agreement off of it. So agriculture is going to be part of the discussions that they've started today in Washington. We're in hopes that there will be some kind of an agreement because, as, as, as Matt has, has explained, uh, soybean markets in particular have been of great concern to us. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty out there as to how it's going to go forward. We need those international markets off of it, and we need China. If you look at the drop-off in the exports that uh, China was responsible for about 60 percent of our overall exports, we've been able to substitute about a third of that market by finding someplace else but at a lower price. And these stocks that we have are equal to about 40% of, of an annual production. And we've got about two-thirds of our on-farm bins that are already full from beans from last year that we haven't been able to sell. So that downward pressure on our prices in a situation that we're not at a price that we can really cover our cost of production. And that's a real concern for us as we're going forward. Well, a concern of yours that you've expressed many times, and of course in the farm, whether it's Cross County, Lee, Phillips, wherever, mm -hmm. is a potential permanent lo or long-lasting. So we're not, U.S. is near Arkansas is the place to grow soybeans. Well, well, that's one of the big concerns. If you look at the part 
partnerships and the investments that China is making in South America and announcements about partnering with Russia to increase alternative sources of our beans, that's a great concern for us. And if you go back, you know, old guys like us, Steve, that can remember Jimmy Carter and the Russian grain embargo to get the Russians out of Afghanistan and the Russians would have to buy grain from us because they couldn't find it in another place. Well, that resulted in creating some great competitors of ours in, in Brazil and Argentina and South America off of it. So this is a long-term concern, and our farmers invested heavily <coughs> over d decades to develop that Chinese market. So, so uh, uh, Matt's comment about uh, uh, patience and and um, uh, uh, perseverance here is is I think right on the mark. Matt King. And one and one of the things to keep in mind with this also, we've not only got this trade trade war going on between the U.S. and China, but China has the Asian or African swine fever that's affected their hog pork. hog industry, their pork industry over there. They've culled about 38, 38 to 40 percent of their hogs, is what reports say. That's equivalent to the entire U.S. hog population that they have culled and taken out of the marketplace. So the impact that this is going to have on their demand for products like corn, soybeans, and other, pro other feed ingredients that they're using, there's, there's going to be long-term impacts to this because there's no known cure for this within those. It's sanitation and things like that, and quite honestly, they just don't have some of those things in China to recover from this quickly. Well, at the same time, the 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 the, the, uh, the dialogue mm -hmm. that between the U.S. and China is underway. We still haven't had any movement in Congress on uh, the renegotiated NAFTA. Nope. And, and it, we're talking about this hemisphere. Yes, and I mean this is something it's it's wanted by farmers, industry, um, even labor unions have come out in support of, of this new USMCA. But we've not seen the movement that we would like to see on this, and it can be a huge thing just to stabilize and and help our, our farmers and ranchers. Yeah, yeah, my, Mexico my and Canada are just the markets. ag community that has the stake no, in, no. in this hemisphere. Talk, talk, talk. Yeah, Mexico and Canada are big markets as well as, as China off of it. So that's a very important agreement for us to get, get finalized off of it. So, you know, there's some expectation that they'll bring it to a vote uh, probably in combination with some budget bill, uh, but making sure that they, they they get that finalized both here and then in Canada is very, very important for us. And we're very blessed here in Arkansas. All of our congressional delegation understands the importance of trade to the state, not only to the agriculture community, but to the rest of the industry here in Arkansas. And Canada and Mexico are two of our largest trading partners as a state. So to get these agreements opened up will really help this the state and ensure that we we have those markets for the long Mexico time. by itself is a $300 million rice market in a $300 million poultry just out of Arkansas. So that's very, very key for us. Well, the, the, the political aspect of this, though, your membership has traditionally been pretty supportive of the current presidential administration. We, we, there was some talk here about patience wearing thin. Mm -hmm. The delegation may be on board, but they don't seem to have much luck in well, persuading the White House to get going. Well, from the delegation standpoint, we're talking about the USMCA, the, the trade agreement between Mexico and Canada. They are very supportive of those. Um, our, our farmers and ranchers, from a, from a trade perspective, we ask the question every time we go to one of our county meetings, how do you feel about trade? And the closest thing to a negative I have, well, it's, it's, it's starting to hurt. But we still, but, but, there's an important but there after that. We're still supportive because agriculture has taken it on the chin for years whenever it comes to China. We haven't been able to export rice to China. We haven't been able to export beef to China. We haven't been able, our poultry products have been blocked for a number of years. So to have access to this 1.3 billion consumers around the world in China is very important for our for Arkansas and our farmers. But very quickly going to Cuba, there was some warming there toward, <laughs> toward the end of the previous administration and now it's it's chilled out again. That's mm -hmm. a huge market, particularly for rice. For, for rice, for the rice market, Cuba would be would be huge. Poultry already exports about a half a billion dollars, I think is what the last numbers were into there. They're able to go through Canada get their financing and things like that. It's a much larger and smaller share of what their export market is, whereas rice, it would be such a huge market. The risk of, of, of non-payment there would be is too much for them to handle at this time. Now we have drone strikes in uh, against oil facilities in Saudi Arabia. What do our farmers care? Well, they burn a lot of <laughs> diesel. 
hundreds very of few, thousands, millions yes. of gallons of diesel. So how much, what's, what's the concern level, Dr. Cochran, now? They're, they're looking at prices, and then they're looking at what the reaction to the, stri to the attack is going to be and what the reaction to the reaction is going to be. And so we're starting to see prices cr creep up a little bit that is interpreted as a lack of confidence on how quickly the Saudis can bring that production back into play. But it's probably more dominated right now on uncertainty, but the stakes are pretty high. And that, Matt King, is mm -hmm. what I keep hearing again and again from my ag sources it's the, and manufacturing. It's the uncertainty. The, the uncertainty around this you is... Can't you can't plan. We, we, you can't plan, you can't hedge, you can't go out and, and plan your risk because if you go out and market at a higher price, or hedge at a higher price and lock that in, you're going to hurt yourself and make yourself less competitive in the long term. We're very blessed here in the United States to have seen as much um, exploration. With, we've had the fracking here in Arkansas for natural gas. You've had that in other parts of the, the country to where we've become more energy independent. We're not as dependent on Saudi Arabia as we were a decade ago. Well, so I our think refining capacity plays into this too, does mm -hmm. it not, Dr. Cochran? Yeah, I mean, we're place. now a net exporter, I believe, of petroleum yes. products. And, and you know, there's another interest of agriculture into our fuels, and that's the renewables and the ethanol and the biodiesel and some of those products that have been a major component of our overall demand. So there's 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 uh, there's a lot of strings in the uh, the ball of twine there is is when you start looking at, at our fuel markets. Well, here's another uh, related uh, string <laughs> to pull and that's interest rates. Now the Fed has just caught cut a quarter point I think this past week off interest rates. What is the filter down effect of that, gentlemen? Will Agriculture is very capital intensive industry and so uh, that's in included in land and operating loans off of it. So lower interest rates are by and large good for agriculture on the finance side, uh, where it's also tied back into our trade because interest rates in the United States relative to other countries has a big uh, issue on the exchange rates. Dollars. Dollars. And that's part of the, the comprehensive discussions with China is the currency manipulation and what's done on those exchange rates that make our products more expensive and their products cheaper off of it. So that's part of the uncertainty that we have here. Pat King. I, I mean, I think our farmers, for the most part right now, they're worried about the profitability year for this year and these lower interest rates can offer opportunities for them going forward to finance at a lower rate because you're so capital intensive you've got such such high amount of capital investment out here you've got a lot of loans for folks um, these interest rates should be beneficial for agriculture but steve the 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 role of a, of a quarter point drop in interest rates is much smaller than the market depression on our prices and trying to get prices above yes. our cost of production and that's going to be dependent upon our global markets off of it. So probably much greater concern on trade than on interest rates at this particular time. Pulling in crops, about time to do that, but this, so that means you look, <laughs> you look forward to plant. How much would you plant if you had, uh, let's just say a thousand acres? <laughs> and what would you plant? <clears throat> I mean, corn right now, given Arkansas's place, corn is a, a, a good crop because you've got the poultry market that's consuming this here. Rice is usually a pretty good crop for folks. If we start with 1,000 acres or down about 400,000 acres here in Arkansas year over year, should make it a better better play for next year. Mark Hawkins. I would say that it, part of it's going to be dependent upon your soil that, that you have here, but uh, rice will be a component of it. Uh, I think corn is a little more attractive. You better be a very efficient soybean producer and have high yields and be able to contain your crops or your costs to be able to, to make a profit in, in soybeans. And then if you've got good cotton ground, cotton is a possibility for some of them. We do have a, a new crop that we're seeing acreage increase in, in peanuts. It tends to be grown on sandier soils, but we're probably going to be up to around 100,000 acres of peanuts next year. And so for, for a small subset of our farmers, peanuts has got some good enthusiasm on it. Dr. Mark Cochran, Matt King, thank you very much thank for you. your time. We're just out of it for right now, <laughs> out of time that it is. And we hope you'll come back. Okay, will do. Will do. Thanks. We'll be back in just a moment. In the meantime, stay tuned to see what state agency and commission meetings are coming up on ARCAN. We're back. 
The news Arkansas received a few days ago was not what it wanted to hear, but was not altogether surprising. Our weight, our collective weight, has gone up. Not by a great deal true, but even a fraction of a decimal point. Rise, that is, in the state's obesity rate translates to hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars in additional expense to both private and public sectors. It's not to mention the decrease it suggests in longevity and health and the increase in heartbreak. Joining us now to assess the situation and what's to be done about it, Dr. Joe Thompson is president and CEO of the Arkansas Center for Health Improvement and vice chair of Healthy Active Arkansas, and Troy Wells, the CEO of Baptist Health and chairman of Health Active Arkansas. Gentlemen, thanks very much for coming in. It is disturbing, even if it's a fraction of a decimal point, percentage point, Dr. Thompson. No, thank you, Steve. Last week, uh, we were disappointed in that the number of Arkansans has increased that are classified as obese in our state. We went from 35% of Arkansas adults to 37% of Arkansas adults. Uh, what's even more concerning is the number of individuals that have been diagnosed with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, went up from 12% to 14%. So I think we are seeing what those of us that have been pushing on the Healthy Active Arkansas Initiative and obesity physical activity efforts for a while, we're seeing what uh, is coming at us, uh, and we're not yet turning the, the, the ship around to actually lead a healthier, uh, more successful lifestyle. Troy Wells, as uh, an executive at a health institution, right. you see the cost going up at every click of the we do, Scale. and you know this is you know personal on a lot of levels, uh, both the time and energy that the institutions are putting into trying to solve the problem and to see the numbers go the way is quite disappointing. But from a from a health system perspective and from a large employer perspective, uh, we see it through two different lenses. Uh, the patients that we treat in our hospitals and our clinics are increasingly sicker, and it's these comorbidities associated with chronic disease, primarily led by obesity, that makes delivering health care so much more complicated and so much more costly. And then on the other side of that, you mentioned in the intro, the economic impact. And so for every dollar that we spend treating chronic disease that again primarily is rooted in obesity and diabetes, the um, loss of productivity in our state is calculated fourfold what the cost of treating the disease is. So it is an economic issue uh, for Arkansas and, and from a workforce uh, perspective I see it every day and from a patient perspective we see it. It is costing business in Arkansas. Correct. Obesity is costing the public treasury obesity in Arkansas plus the related ailments, uh, hypertension, uh, yeah. Cardiac. Yeah, you know, we've looked actually, the state employees, public school employees do a health risk appraisal and, and report their height and their weight and, and their uh, tobacco use. Uh, we calculated the, the body mass index from their height and weight and looked at what they cost. And basically an obese or a physically an inactive person costs about a third more than a regular, you know, healthy and physically active person. The other thing in the report that, that is concerning is about one third of our Kansans get no physical activity within the month. Uh, so this is really, I mean, both on the, the weight problem and on the physical activity problem, uh, a coming epidemic for our state of, of diabetes and then the downstream implications for heart disease, hypertension, even cancer associated with obesity now. Yeah, well, walk us through a, a case of an obesity that walks into one of your facilities. Sure. Okay, what? John Doe, Jane right. Doe. Yeah. Well, so let's take a surgical. What are we looking at? Sure, let's talk, take a surgical patient. So 20 years ago, um, anybody could walk in and most hospital facilities were perfectly well equipped to deal with any person that came in the door and today uh, the obesity ep epidemic has caused hospitals to have to step back and reconfigure everything from CT scanners and the size of a patient you can fit through one, uh, operating tables that will hold the capa weight capacity. And then the thing that I see that, that really is uh, disturbing and, and hard for us to deal with from a healthcare system perspective is the doctors. Um, the, the amount of energy and effort it takes and exhaustion it takes for a surgeon to operate on a morbidly obese patient is, is dramatically different than if it were one of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it's, so it puts a, an additional stress on healthcare providers. Uh, the, those chronic diseases take something that would be normally a routine treatment and make it very, very complicated. So it does add cost, it adds time, uh, it adds uh, uh, complexity to recovery. And so from a healthcare perspective, that's, the, that's the, the impact that we see. Joe Thompson, I am 25 years old. I'm 25 pounds overweight, maybe 30, don't get much exercise. 
what am I looking at? Well, I think, I think you know, weight creeps up on you over time. So I think people should be cognizant, uh, you know, as they enter their young adulthood, middle age, uh, to watch your weight. I mean, your calories that you take in, if you don't burn them off, your body is going to store them uh, for the next ice age. I don't think we're going to have the next ice age, but uh, your body is ready for that. Uh, so I, I really do think uh, an individual ought to, on a regular basis, uh, monitor their weight, and if they are slowly creeping up, uh, start to modify different behaviors. If I don't modify, what am I looking at clinically, generally? Well, yeah. you know, obesity and is, how yeah, obesity stresses your body out. Uh, the more weight you have, the more your body's having not only to carry it around, but it's also stressing out uh, your metabolic system so that you actually end up being out of balance for a while. Uh, metabolic syndrome is what uh, clinically it becomes diagnosed at. And that's on the way to where your body cannot regulate its blood sugar so that then your insulin runs out and you become a diabetic. Uh, diabetes itself harms blood vessels, whether it's in your eyes to cause blindness, your heart to cause heart attacks, your kidneys to cause renal failure. Uh, that's the pathway. Uh, so I think this is really important for folks to recognize uh, that when they start seeing that they're gaining weight, it, that's the point in time that they need to actually take action, not to wait till they have some of these downstream conditions. We ha seem to have lost ground by these statistics anyway in the last reporting period. Is what we're doing just not effective? People not paying attention? Have we not got their attention or what? I always, you know, I, we talk about the challenge and swimming upstream in, in our state and our community. And, um, you know, this is, we got here over a couple of generations. Uh, in, in, in some ways, it's a symptom of a successful uh, world. You know, we, we're all doing better uh, and, and foods become cheap. And cheap foods usually not that good for us, but it's abundant. And so in some ways we're, we're living great. At the same time, this is a symptom of that kind of lifestyle. It's killing us. It, it's kill yeah, the good times are killing us in a way. And then yet at the same time, the irony in that is we're also in a state where, where there are people that don't get enough to eat every day. Mm -hmm. And so trying to balance how do we keep people fed and how do we keep them eating the right things is really a challenge both economically and just from a poly policy perspective perspective and uh, from a lifestyle perspective. Uh, so, uh, you know, lots of challenges. But the other thing, I guess, and we talk about this in Healthy Active Arkansas, is there's no one thing. You know, everybody looks for the silver bullet, and, and there's no one thing. It takes uh, an environment that makes it easier for people to do better. It takes education we talked about uh, before the show, uh, people understanding how to eat and what to eat, what not to eat. Uh, there's a huge gap in uh, nutritional literacy uh, in people and so you know in its community and its physical infrastructure and uh, making exercise easy and making the physical environment a place where it's safe to go and be outside and do mm -hmm. active things it takes all that uh, to escape our um, you know a time when people ate what they could could grow and it was good for you right. and they worked all day and had physical activity and we've gone past all that and we need to learn to live in a different kind of world. There, there are some bright spots. I, I don't want this, I mean the report is a, is a negative report for our Kansans as a whole. But in our Healthy Active Arkansas effort, we've got, you know, we've tripled the number of baby-friendly hospitals where moms are starting out breastfeeding as a primary source of food. We know that offers lifetime protection uh, for obesity. Uh, the Moralton School System, Champions for Health, made an mm -hmm. intensive effort at Moralton Intermediate School by changing, uh, putting in a water bottle filling station, having you know, garden towers in their science class, every month having a different physical activity challenge with the students, engaging with the teachers, reaching out to the parents. They actually showed a reduction in overweight and obese children within nine months in the Moralton Intermediate School. So, but they did everything. It was a full court press to change the environment to change the food to have kids move to water as opposed to sugar sweetened beverages uh, and getting into the home with getting the into the home parents. with the pa parents yeah. it's going to take that you know full court press in our communities to make the healthy choice be the easy choice what is holding back the full court press what why can't what was done in Marlton be yeah magically well I think that the, the interesting thing about the Moralton case is that we I think Joe's group has actually done some studies to shut to say yes this made a significant statistically significant impact it worked up until now I think single and even double interventions have not demonstrated the kind of results that we want. So identifying what really does make an impact, we find that out. Now we need to put the resources behind it, bring people to the table, whether it's institutions, business community, to now say this works, let's do more of it. 
in that space, you know, the Delta Dental Foundation has funded 70 schools to put new water bottle filling stations, the things you see at the airport and so forth, right. to get students off of the sugar-sweetened beverages. If I could wave my wand and do one thing, it would have people mm -hmm. cease to drink empty calories in sugar-sweetened beverages. And yes, sweet tea is a sugar-sweetened beverage, <laughs> uh, but, but you know, those are empty calories that do you no good, but just add to your caloric intake, which means you gotta burn it off or you're gonna store it. All right. Final words on this subject. I just, I, you know, it's a community issue. It's a state issue. It's a family issue. You really have to think about it in all those different ways and figure out, again, I think what works, how we can start to make a bigger impact. A lot of hard work's gone on, and, and it's, it's frustrating at times, but uh, I think the, the, what we've learned is you've got to think about it comprehensively, holistically, mm -hmm. and it's not something the healthcare system can fix. It's not something the schools can fix alone. It's not something that it takes everybody right. uh, in a community to make it work. Is, is there with seconds remaining, is this the time for government to take a more proactive level or uh, approach? You know, we our, our general spirit. Yeah, our general assembly has done some things. They've required recess in elementary schools now across all the state, which you know, it's not rocket science, but that's getting kids up and active. I, I think we're making steps, but I really do think I agree with Troy. This is going to be a community-wide effort. Employers health care providers, schools, parents, churches, you know, we need to, we need to recognize that, that we are taking care of our body uh, in a way that, that reflects our, our, our morals. Gentlemen, thanks very much thank for coming you, in. Thank you. Very important thank subject, you. and we hope you'll come back. Thank you. Look forward to it. That's our broadcast for this week. Thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89.